side quests are confusing to me. While always existing with positive intentions to improve the player's experience, I often find myself feeling constrained, anxious, and straight up bored by the optional activities. Yet, I can't help completing them. This is the contradiction of player experience, the anomaly that plagues modern game design. This is my side quest paradox. I say my because, as we'll momentarily see, much of this issue is birthed in the recesses of my video game rotted brain. Let me explain myself. Oftentimes, I beat all the side quests before a game's ending to prepare for the finality of the main campaign, as I have always viewed them as supplementary material to the game's focus. Meaning, I struggle to find a point in completing tasks that were meant to prepare me for an already completed story when in the post-game. Hence the cramming. No quest can be left undone before the game's conclusion because if I beat the game, what are the side quests helping me work towards? By extension, my insufferable type A personality can't handle a list unchecked. Every single two must be dude to satisfy the little CEO in my brain demanding maximum efficiency and productivity. Lastly, what if I miss out on some dope content? I don't want to be the one guy that never unlocked Critter and Super Mario Sluggers just because I was too caught up in saving the baseball kingdom. The consequences of this cramming is that I'm often overpowered for the final fight and aspects of the main campaign, making for a less enjoyable and somewhat dull experience by completing what was designed to do the opposite, with that boredom only being compounded if the side quests are as menial as collect 50 germic biomicropedials for a small monetary reward. A perfect example of this phenomenon can be seen by recounting my first completion of Breath of the Wild. Some say it's like a first love. One never forgets their first time in that beautiful rendition of Hyrule. However, this means I will sadly always remember the disappointment I felt during the final fight against Ganon. Every quest, done. Every heart, collected. Stamina, maxed. Korok seeds, okay, I didn't get them all, but enough to max out my weapon slots. I'm just not a masochist. With an inventory overflowing with hearty durian meals and elemental swords, I finally felt ready to beat Ganon, and Jesus, I didn't just beat him, I demeaned him. I embarrassed him. In a game so unexpectedly difficult for the franchise, I felt more challenged in the tutorial area than the depths of a poisoned Hyrule castle due to my overleveling, thus blemishing what was otherwise a perfect video game experience. Well, nearly perfect, as some of those side quests were also boring, which only further damaged my experience with the game when I forced myself to complete all of them in a resounding act of self-sabotage. Having seemingly learned from my past mistakes, there are times where I wait to complete certain quests. I can grow impatient with my own obsessions, becoming tired of endlessly completing tasks that are not central to the game's focus. Yet, this raises another issue, as by the time I've completed the campaign and returned to these activities, they can oftentimes end up being incredibly easy because... I just beat the game. I completed the final task of the developer's program to prove my mastery of every mechanic in the game, so so what challenge could there be in a quest that was meant to complete 50 hours, 20 levels, 8 haircuts, and 50 godlike weapons ago? And if I was supposed to complete those quests so long ago, the rewards are going to be in line with that difficulty level. Why continue with relatively unimportant and underwhelming tasks in terms of rewards and experience? There is no motivation to do side quests if the rewards are either pointless or don't live up to the narrative that I just finished. Why would I need a super cool, strong weapon if I have nothing to fight it with? On the other hand, do I really want that weapon that could one-shot the final boss? In essence, my experiences completing side quests can go down two paths being completed before the ending and after the ending of the campaign. In the pre-ending direction, side quests are extensions of the main campaign that can dampen the quality of its ending or make for a tedious time sink with monotonous tasks and unsatisfying rewards that I can't pry myself away from for FOMO and values of productivity. In the post-ending direction, side quests are, more often than not, time wasters that provide no real incentive to complete due to lackluster rewards, lack of attachment to the campaign, and boredom due to a lack of challenge. Granted, there is a level of generalities at play here, but yes, my side quest experience usually boils down to either I do them and feel bored, stressed, and overwhelmed, or I don't and miss out on potentially valuable experiences while simultaneously risking the apocalyptic threat of being bored later on. Clearly, side quests are complicated in design, which makes me wonder, is there a solution to my side quest paradox? To determine if my paradox can be solved or if I'm just fundamentally broken as a human being, we have to first understand how side quests have been historically defined in games. Often regarded as the first game to have side quests, the original Legend of Zelda and Tears of Radiance offered players the opportunity to collect optional heart pieces and complete missions that altered how characters interacted with you, respectively. Interestingly, this seems to be the two significant and traditional roles side quests play in games, to provide experiences that contextualize the world and to strengthen the player, presumably 
inevitably to tackle the main quest. However, as games have become increasingly complex, so have their side quests and the roles they perform. Looking to the article Side Quest Syndrome, Designing the Roads Less Traveled by Game Informer Editorial, we can learn of some of the roles side quests play from industry professionals, those being to liven and contextualize the world with characters and missions, to allow developers to experiment with gameplay mechanics in a safe environment, recount and build lore, establish player agency, act as signposts to guide players through an open world, to aid in the game's pacing by juggling both tone and mechanics, and of course the aforementioned role of providing players with more entertaining experiences as well as opportunities to strengthen their character. That is a lot. With so many roles to play, it is no wonder side quests can be so varied in both design and quality, especially when side quests are designed to juggle multiple of these tasks while still having to be accessible and entertaining to a large number of players. This complexity is only exacerbated when, lest you forget, Side quests are optional, meaning they are often lower on the totem pole of priorities in game development. Meaning, with a seemingly infinite amount of shoes to fill and a varying degree of value applied to them by different developers across games, side quests can take a litany of forms that vary in quality and entertainment. When I'm signing up for a side quest, am I going to collect 50 MacGuffins or am I going to fight a secret boss? What a side quest can look like to fulfill these roles can be anything, and tradition demarcates which form of side quest has been understood as more or less entertaining. And I believe this introduces the idea of universality, and by extension, definition. Now developers have to ask, what is each side quest supposed to do both in a game and for the player? How does the player understand them in relation to the rest of the game? What will one be doing in said side quest and for what? These questions, especially the final one, also linger over the gamer as they explore the lands between or Hyrule, searching for and determining what experiences are valuable, just as developers wonder how they can make those experiences valuable for the player, while simultaneously executing the mechanical desire of, say, guiding the player in an open world or controlling the pacing. Side quests require definition by the developer as to the role they are performing, and with the incredible, infinite potential we've discussed, it is clear that a lack of universality makes side quest design infinitely more difficult. If there is a single way to guarantee everyone would enjoy a given quest, then side quests could implement that tactic for consistently entertaining and informative ventures. While a single element is difficult to nail down, I want to take a look at some elements of side quest design that I feel can help aid in solving my personal side quest paradox and potentially lead us towards that universal truth of game design, if there even is one. The way a side quest is presented to the player is crucial in convincing them whether to play it or not, at least for this player. By framing, I'm referring to how a quest is positioned in a game and how much information is delivered to the player. Do I know what experience I'm in for? If so, it better deliver on that promise lest I feel cheated. Or if choosing to relay more info, the level of information provided has to be immediately interesting or else a player could be more apt to skip it, or in my case, doing it anyways and feeling bored as a result. However, knowing nothing about a side quest can be just as intriguing, even more so, as the air of mystery is often enough to keep me going. But there is of course the developers running the risk of giving players something they unintentionally followed and never asked for. Going further, how is the quest framed in context of the game and why? Is the quest labeled as a side quest as intentionally tangential to the main plot as post-game content. For example, there's the ever-tired term of ludonarrative dissonance. This video essay cliche can come as a result of poor framing. If a side quest is framed as being less important than the events of the main story, then no one will feel incentivized to play it, or in my scenario, I would play it and just suffer the effects of the dissonance. Not every side quest has to be framed as superseding the main narrative, but it is an element developers should keep in mind when designing their quests. There's also the improper framing of side content on a more mechanical level. While this example comes from the main game, Pokemon Scarlet has received complaints for its lacking map. With no level listings or level balancing, the player is essentially in the dark on what content is right for their place in the game. While the idea is promising, letting players explore the world and decide for themselves where to go, due to the history of the franchise being structured around gyms that progress linearly, it feels more like a half step towards innovation. As instead of being guided down a path through story, players simply flounder around the world with an illusion of choice on which gym to take on. Or, for example, if a side quest is built up to be one with an engaging story and entertaining mechanics, only for it to be that cursed go here, do this, done format, disappointing a player like myself is one thing, but misleading them is a guarantee to disincentivize them from exploring optional content. The Pokemon example can then extend to the difference between post-game content and side quests. Is a piece of content so difficult I shouldn't be allowed access until after the story. In this case, I would personally like that label, as it would give me some security that, yes, I don't need to complete everything before the end in order to succeed, and that enjoyable experiences are still available outside of the main quest, thus mitigating my crippling FOMO. Framing then is directly related to accessibility. As a self-proclaimed campaign fanatic, exploring a vast open world can be a difficult balancing act, due to the fact I find myself so tied to the central quest 
yet unable to ignore side activities, meaning I often complete side quests that are introduced through the campaign, which I personally love, and as stated in the Game Informer article, is a tactic commonly used by developers to ensure their players can access side content. While there is certainly something to say about finding red on top of Mount Silver with no previous knowledge or quest marker, for a player like myself that doesn't even usually have the time to search every corner of a massive open world, something nearly every modern game includes, I love seeing quests that stem from the campaign, not only for ease of accessibility, but for motivating factors as well. By being related to the main quest, it is thus framed as being significant and worth the player's time regardless of reward, because one can assume you'll be making at least some sort of progress with the story now residing in the player's mind as they perform the quest. But that doesn't mean rewards aren't important. On the contrary, they're one of the biggest elements of side quest design, and one of my own personal gripes with optional adventures. Back to Breath of the Wild, collecting 10 kukos for 50 rupees or whatever it was felt pretty insulting. On the other hand, getting to see a physical town with plenty of available stores and resources was a constant motivator for the Terrytown side quest. These are examples of what gaming video essayists, and I don't include myself in that category, I'm still learning, call extrinsic rewards, or a tangible reward for completing an activity. Like I said before, for me, completing quests before the main campaign is motivated by the extrinsic reward that aid in my progression of the story. However, being given a lackluster reward leaves me feeling unfulfilled, and that goes for pre- and post-games. If I go back to old quests after the main campaign and I get a level 2 weapon my character could realistically snap in half with a pinky toe, that tells me the other side quests are simply not worth completing. Or if it's a strong reward but I already beat the game, then why even try and get that reward in the first place? The answer to these questions can be potentially solved by intrinsic motivation or the player being motivated by their own personal will to complete that activity. Intrinsic motivation can come in a variety of forms, with narrative, world exploration, player agency, variety in and utilization of fun gameplay mechanics, and most notably for myself, difficulty. This one is simple. If a quest is too easy, I'm going to be bored. If a quest is too hard, I'm going to be infuriated as I pound my head against a wall for losing to Berserker number 9 for the billionth time I'm getting out of war, Jesus Christ, why I choose this? Meaning, side quests should have matching difficulty for their desired, fair experience. A side quest should probably not be designed to be so hard it can never be completed. Developers can and should provide challenges, but within reason. I say this instead of claiming all side quests should provide the perfect level of challenge because, at the end of the day, not every quest is looking to achieve the same thing. A date with Kaz and Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is not trying to test the player's mastery of the game, but instead provide a comical experience. In this way, the side up demonstrates how a side quest can perform multiple roles and use these elements in unique ways to provide a truly engaging and entertaining quest. By providing variety in mechanics and story, the mission paces the game. Because it is framed as being tangential to the main plot, I don't feel bad for either skipping it for later or completing it in the moment due to the ease of accessibility. The difficulty is light, but purposely so to make room for an intrinsically rewarding experience through the aforementioned variety in comedy. However, the quest is careful to not spoil everything in its bio, teasing me to explore what could be happening inside of the box. Finally, because side ups unlock at a gradual pace with the main campaign, it never felt out of reach for me to complete it whenever I choose to do so. You can clearly see how, despite being a waste of time on the surface, A Day with Kaz actually utilizes many elements of side quest design to provide a unique and memorable optional endeavor, one which I think finally gives me some insight on how to solve my side quest paradox. First, there's the issue of my brain. Like I said before, this essay has been more of a personal look at side quests, about why I struggle completing them or not. Meaning, the first solution I can think of to solving my paradox is shifting my own mindset around side quests as a whole. After reading articles and interviews from game developers, as well as other people's experiences with side quests, I've realized that my approach of optional content always linking back to the main campaign as a form of practice is somewhat flawed. Sure, a player can progress through the story by getting valuable extrinsic rewards from optional content, but a player can also help an insecure dominatrix become in her role just for the hell of it. And that experience doesn't have to be tied to the campaign to still have value to the player. In fact, that Yakuza 0 quest is valuable because it isn't attached to the main campaign. Precisely because the quest is optional, it has the opportunity to create crazy side stories that simply wouldn't make sense in relation to the main story. This perspective shift allows me to also view side quests, to quote a wise redditor, two words really conjoined, as a buffet. By understanding quests as not necessitating a direct tie to the campaign to be valuable, or that every quest isn't inherently valuable by being preparation for the main story, I can now more easily pick and choose my experiences based on what sounds interesting. This again has the caveat of knowing the experience I'm in for via framing, but that brings me to the next solution that melds developer and player, aka me. The importance of playing to a game's context. See, Breath of the Wild side content was so interesting to me, not just because it all felt meaningful, but because it was fun to find. By having an enjoyable open world, Nintendo was able to pry the story-oriented player from, well, 
the story in order to journey Hyrule. These side quests and side activities were so easy to complete because they just appeared, or I may even stumble onto a quest giver already having done the quest. Similarly, stumbling onto a mysterious object or event that would later become a quest is what made the world so appealing in the first place. In Breath of the Wild, side content is often presented to the player with less direction than other open world games, and I loved that style. However, that wouldn't work as well for a player like me in a game like God of War Ragnarok, where exploration is more linear and information is mostly completely deployed to the player. Meaning, properly framing the side quest both in the way of my own mind and the developer's design makes the quest entertaining when positioned in accordance with the game's themes and established framework. If I can be more open to quest structure and design I'm not used to, I'll be more likely to complete and enjoy quests by now understanding their design doesn't have to be universal to be entertaining. It just has to be designed in accordance with the loop I already find entertaining established by the developers. However, I've also learned that my idea of a reward must be challenged in a variety of ways. By originally viewing side quests only in relation to the main campaign, I missed the forest for the trees. Now, looking back to my previous gaming experiences, I've realized some of my most enjoyable side questing has been done due to a variety of gameplay mechanics. I love experimenting, which is what made Breath of the Wild and the now released Tears of the Kingdom so rewarding for me in terms of side content. I could do so much with the mechanics at play, and the developers could design experimental activities for me to engage with. Back to Yakuza, although the side quests may seem like a waste of time to some players for how different they are from the rest of the game, it is precisely because of that variety that Yakuza as a series even remains successful. Clearly, just as it is important to design and frame quests in accordance to a game's themes and style, I also find it just as important to allow for experimental gameplay and experiences to act as its own intrinsic reward, even if it does not relate to or prepare me for the main quest. But the most important aspect of side quest design that can fix my paradox is another form of intrinsic reward, another way to satisfy the player regardless of tangible items given or mechanics performed narrative. Through all of my research, one commonality shown through that consistently provided players with meaningful experiences, the creation of an engaging arc. SideQuest designer for CD Projekt Red, Nicholas Calm, says as much, narrative is our strength, and we firmly believe that a good narrative is a good incentive for side content. In the end, aren't we all curious about stories if they're presented well? If the content is made in a way that actually makes these explorations worthwhile, rewards the player with an interesting moral dilemma, or a thrilling plot twist, or even just a bag of laughs, then we think players will feel good about that, and will encourage them to explore more. And this through line can even be connected to our own examples. The reason I remember that Breath of the Wild Kugo quest, despite its utterly useless reward and monotonous task, was the interesting character of Kato, who chose his Kukos over his wife in a comical twist that cemented the miscellaneous activity into my mind. Red vs Gold creates a personal narrative in the player, battling the silent protagonist for respect from a grand master. And of course, the Bloody Baron quest from The Witcher 3 itself has been praised because of its intriguing narrative. According to the Game Informer article, rather than simply showering players with XP and loot, the ultimate reward for completing side content is the chance to learn more about Geralt, his friends, and the war-stricken realm around them, such as the quality of the game's writing and presentation. Meaning, it seems like the universal factor of entertaining quests, if there ever was one, is a well-written and executed narrative, whether it be a joke, or a drama, a tragedy or moral dilemma, a single memorable character, or the death of an important one, creating side quests in stages with their own arcs and narrative structures can, as proven with the Kuko Man, make even the most boring tasks a little easier to complete. If I revisit a quest after beating the campaign and it's too easy or it gives me a useless reward, the story surrounding those superfluous elements is great, the monotony disappears as engagement builds. Similarly, with my new frame of mind, viewing side stories as just that allows me to experience them without the baggage of the main campaign weighing me down. No longer is an unrelated side quest a flaw or a waste of time, but an exciting opportunity to see the variety of people, places, and narratives that comprise a game's world. By providing narrative as an intrinsic reward and changing my perspective on side quests to view rewards as not having to be tangible items to prepare me for the final fight, developers can be confident in their side quest being consistently engaging for the player. And there we have it. Paradox quelled in a once rigid player's video game future, opening itself up to an infinite sea of endlessly enjoyable experiences. If I don't want to complete a quest, I don't have to. But if I choose to engage with side content, I shouldn't be upset if it doesn't prepare me for the final boss or isn't tied to the campaign. In fact, I should celebrate that fact if it is executed well just as I can be confident in a quest being valuable, as long as it has a solid story. I hope that this winding exploration of game theory and design analysis, admittedly to the best of my lacking ability, has provided you with some solutions to your own side quest paradoxes, for as we've seen, one solution opens up a door to a million other issues. Thanks for watching. I'm going to try and not cry from pure joy by playing Tears of the Kingdom, while also implementing this new mindset towards side content. You probably won't see me for, let's be safe and call it a couple of months, there's a lot of side quests to complete.